Broadway's pastor, Broadway's beloved pastor. Appreciated pastor, a very appreciated pastor. Yeah, yeah, that's extra. Yeah. And it, and it is, uh, thank you so much for the expression of appreciation. Um, that's, and that, that's helpful, you know, pastors have families, people that love them, and, and they, they will check in and say, How, how's the church treating you? And you can always say, yeah, right. So, and it encourages them. Uh, I never had any doubt about your love and, and your regard for us as we've come here. And so I want to bring to you the, the third part of this sermon series uh, that if you, the, you can take the first letter of John, sit down and, and, and read it once every day for a while and you'll begin to see new things and, and amazing things that God is lifting out of there and putting down into your heart. And um, so John began with, with this declaration of the, of the incarnation. It's almost that he said, you know, I want you to re relive Christmas again. You know, God became man and, and we, we could touch him with our hands. We could look at him and see him with our eyes. We could hear him with our ears. And it wasn't just an amazing person. It wasn't just an extremely knowledgeable person. It wasn't a person with great insights that we wanted to share. It was the word of life really God. It came among us and we have a participation with him. Uh, we have a fellowship with him and this also becomes a fellowship with us. And this, this participation with God, this fellowship with God is that which is suddenly inside us and it just has to come out. He just has to tell people about it. This, this is what we're proclaiming to you. And it gives us joy, makes our joy complete to do that. And then, he's, then he just takes the whole subject again. And he, and he says there's such a thing as, as walking in the light. You don't want to walk in darkness. You want to have the light of God leading you, giving you Oh, guidance for the, the week's problems, the, the problems of today. There's, there's a very real aspect where God is available. His, his wisdom is just that, which comes from above, which comes outside of what we are able to do. And you can take your dilemmas, your problems to him, and, and he will answer that prayer. But also he is all the time trying to lead you into a closer walk with him, a walking with the light that, that takes you, as he said, walking in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. Uh, a greater, greater and deeper participation with each other's lives, and also the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin, and he lifts up at the center of all that, saying, you look at the cross of Christ. It's not just about, it's not about you, it's about Jesus, Jesus being made evident in your life and mine, that I'm going to encounter these many crosses, I'm going to encounter these times when I'm able to surrender myself, and I'm going to live sourced entirely by the Father, and I'm going to live just surrendered to the Father's aims, and when that happens, we are walking in the light, and he takes us on to a deeper walk of holiness, where his peace, his joy, his love, his th just all those, all those aspects of the image of Christ in our hearts begin to live and move and be genuinely part of how we relate and how we work. Now, you get to this last scripture, which is verses 8, 9, and 10. And it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Lord, ask that, that as our, our hearts are gathered around the scripture as we, we feast on your word together, sharing this, that you, you give us, Lord, your light and your help as we walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, of course, <clears throat> I think we, he left off last week, we were talking about walking in the light. And again, that is a a walk with God, a participating walk with God, where his, his power is at work within us, his spirit is guiding us forward, uh, it is toward holiness, it is, it is toward that, that his peace really would rule in your heart, his patience would be made evident, his, his wisdom would be guiding your actions. And so we walk in the light, walk with God. And I, since he brings up the unpleasant problem that we have sin. Uh, we have sin that, that actually should admit if we confess our sins. Or the opposite, if we say we have no sin. 
I think it's good just to, just to note what a, what a terrible job we generally do of walking with God, of, of being guided by God. I, I like to think that, that uh, you, our, you know, when we talk about, well, there's sin going on in your life, remember that the New Testament word for sin is, is best translated as missing the mark. There are, there are horrible sins. There are extremely damaging sins. There are things that you can do that have terrible consequences, but the general New Testament word for it is missing the mark. This is what God had intended for you, and you veered. Which means, which means a very equal opportunity statement about your, your life because you don't have to say, well, I didn't do anything I could get convicted. You can't prove what I did this week. That, that's not known. You missed the mark. You missed what God was trying to express in your life, and it's, and it's a great big deal. Our walking with God so much kind of reminds me if, if, a, if a kid, a, son is, a little boy is going to go with his dad to the hardware store, to the, to the Menards or to the Lowe's, okay? Now that is a great outing. It's a wonderful outing because the dress code is like, pfft, you can wear whatever you want, you know, and it's all full of lawn tractors and, and things and bright colors and wood. You can smell the wood. You can ride around in a great big cart. Trip to the, to the Menards or the Lowe's or something is a great trip for the young man to go with his dad. Now, now if you have a child that's young enough, you know, the dad will have to hold on to the kid's hand because he's already told him don't climb on the tractors don't play with the saw blades don't you know knock the cans of paint over well now he's not old enough to be trusted just to do that because he was told so you have a hold of his hand and so he's being taken to the hardware store but but what he actually has is he pulled over this way and he's pulled over that way he might walk along peacefully really nice for a little bit and then he'll stop drag back because he wants to look at him or he'll rush ahead. If they're really small, they pull, remember that trick where they'll just drop all their weight right where they're at, you know, boom, and, and you have to kind of gather them up and, and, and in, the, in the midst of all this dragging, pulling this way, pulling, pulling to the right, to the left, lunging ahead, hanging back. If you ask the little boy when they got back, what did you do? He would say, my dad took me to the hardware store. Well, you could almost put air quotes around you. He took you to the heart. No, you dragged this way. You pulled that way. Ahead, back, drop him to the ground. This is how so often as we walk with God, as he guides us along through life, it is truly a time of being guided. It is truly there are seasons in our life where God is definitely di directing and we know it. But that's our, that's our part of it. Pull, drag, fall back. We can say we're, we, we do a bad job of this. And John is saying, I want you to, to see that. You don't, don't go around saying, I don't have any sin anytime I miss the mark. You're deceiving yourself. You're an imposter. That's kind of how that word goes. And oh, we can say that. Oh, we, we, we want to talk about that going in, into church with a facade. Okay? looking different than what you really are. I do that. I'm actually a 29-year-old man. But I look like this, just to freak you out, okay? But no. Now, Nathaniel Hawthorne, American author writing in the 1700s, wrote a story called The Minister's Black Veil. And he, and he, and he said it, it's actually based on some, some true events, and he wove a story around it. He said there, there was a nice New England congregational church, uh, you know, powerful Bible-believing church and with, that liked their sermons serious and their pastoral care earnest and all, and they had a minister. And then the day, uh, one Sunday came, and of course, I love congregational churches, never had a chance to preach in one, but they had a door like right there where they, they do the whole service, and then they, when it's time for the sermon, the door opens and the minister comes out. That, you get a real sense of presence there, a real sense of your importance. Probably don't need any of that. But anyway, that's how they did. He came out wearing a black veil, kind of two folds of crepe, as Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, described it, that you could just maybe see his chin. You could never see his eyes. You could tell he could probably see through that, but you're not going to see him too shadowy behind that. Came out without a word of explanation. 
greeted people, you know, wait, you know bow, bowed to one of the older members, you know, and, and then did his text and did his sermon. Could have heard a pin drop as people are saying, what? Did he, did he, did he have a scar? Did it wound or something? You know, not a word of explanation. He, he just patted the children on the head after the service and greeted people and went back to his house. And day after day after day after day, he wore this black veil in front of his face. The church got, had had enough of it, sent a group to tell him, what's with the veil? I think you should take it off. People are saying you must have done something awful. They, they know what something on your conscience, they actually failed in that. They couldn't face down the man whose eyes they could not see, the man who was looking at them, but they couldn't tell what he, what he was thinking. Uh, his very nearest and dearest could only get out of him that it was a vow. He said, no man shall see my face as long as I live. And they say, you know, and they couldn't get out of him whether he felt he'd done something horrible or, or what. It made him an effective minister. You couldn't help but pay attention to the sermon when you knew it was he was he could be looking at you people in the pastoral care and the care of souls found that they could not lie to that man whose eyes they could not see people would put off dying so this man could come and sort them out before they went to see the lord and finally this man after a long period and no one had seen his face is on his own deathbed and of course it's a short story so he's allowed to give a speech he says look you know, when people are straightforward and open with their God, when friends do not conceal their thoughts from friends, when lovers are completely open to one another, then talk to me about this, but when I look out, I see every face wearing a black veil. And then, of course, he gasps and dies. You know, oh, no, that, that. Every face wearing a black veil. That, Hawthorne brings up this truth. We, mu we must not say we have no sin. We don't want to be that one that w we, we can't help but carry in front of us this strangeness, strangeness about our lives that we, we are called to be inhabited by Christ, called to walk in his presence, to live in his light. And yet there is this that we must confess before God. And so we we move into this looking and saying, well, well what, are, what am I supposed to do with this? Now, because here's the, you know, that I am supposed to grow in his word, and I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to, to, you know, to live his life, and John is saying there's something that's going to hold you back. Two words in that verse. If we say we have no sin, I have a nice toaster. It did a great job this morning. That's not how John says it. John means have. I have a car, best car ever owned, but that's not the same thing. He's using the word have like a child, a, a, a mother has a child before it is born, bears it, holds it right there. If John says, you say, if you say you don't have within you this difficulty of sin, and then the truth is not in you. Also, that's an important in. It's meaning at rest in, residing there. Not in as in the truth is somewhere near. No, right in here. You understand the, the life that John is lifting up for you? A recognition that, that you're being redeemed every day because of, because of each encounter of God with you will lay lay open yet, yet another side of your heart, and the truth will live in there. God's word will live in there. And what is God's word? Living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Is it any wonder we have a trouble walking with God? Is it any wonder that we could shout to ourselves every morning, you can't handle the truth because the truth cuts. The truth saws away at what I have designed around my life to make sure it's all about me. John is pointing to a life that says, you can have the truth living in you. This is part. His word will be life to you and will ex be expressed through your life.
when you embrace it. And then, of course, he says, goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He is bringing up here that there's sin that needs confessed. There's a truth that needs affirmed, and we want to avoid that. We want to avoid that, I would say, pretty much at all costs. We are not excited about confessing sin. You know, if you, you don't have to be a pastor to get people to come to you with their personal problems. You might have noticed that. All you have to do is have a listening ear and be, seem to be somewhat together, and people will want to tell you about, about their stuff. And if you notice, if somebody is at brass rags with their spouse or a good friend, and they had the argument, and there was damage done, and there even was an apology made. Have you ever heard? But he never admitted he was wrong. You heard that one? I've heard that one. I've heard that one off and on all my life. You know, it's, it's interesting, it, it, you know, that, uh, that the same book author that gave us the five love languages talks about apology languages and says, you know, we get a lot of half apologies that more or less say, I'm sorry you didn't like what I said. It's not really an apology, is it? You know, it's just to say, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, not saying I was wrong. Not saying I recognize the pain that I caused you. Not saying something like I have taken these steps that will never be done again. But again, confessing is saying, I was wrong. And we do not do that easily. Now, my friend David, actually he's a friend of the whole family. My friend David, he and his twin brother, uh, when the, after they were born, the doctor gave the family the news that, that they had a genetic condition that meant that they would, their eyesight, they'd probably lose their eyesight in their, in their 20s. And it has proven to be true. Late in, late in his 20s, Dave is, is, um, is pretty much legally blind. In fact, legally blind to the point where, you know, blobs and shadows and shapes and that's it. He, they knew this was coming. Actually, doctors did a lot better job on him than they assumed. And praise God, there will be doctors later on that will solve the whole problem. But he's, he became legally blind. And so two years ago, he was sharing this, this with me, said two years ago, his doctor said, you need to get the white cane, you know, the white cane with a little, little red tip. And David said, no, no, I don't want the white cane with the red tip. I'm, you know, no, 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 that's, no, no, we're not going to do that. And so he went on about a year. And he went back to the doctor, and the doctor again, just telling you the truth. You need, wear, you need to carry the white cane. It was a fine. White cane, great, great. That's, that's, nobody ever said I needed a white cane to look really classy and cool. No, you know, nobody ever said that. I remember my cousin Buddy had the white cane and tapped it around. He was, he was my mom's cousin. He was lots of fun. If he asked you a question he didn't answer, he'd say things like, I can't hear your head rattle. You're going to have to speak up. Things. He was a great guy, a lot of fun. And David got his white cane, and he said, I should have done it two years ago. It is like Moses' rod. Instead of people being angry because you're standing there in the way, it all look like what you're doing. They're considerate. Instead of people getting in your way when you're trying to make, your, make, make a move down, a, down an aisle, they, the, it parts like the Red Sea. Instead of people not being able to understand what is going on with you, they say, oh, here, let me open the door. Let me assist. Let me use, my, use some instructions to tell you where to go. She should have got the white cane a long time ago. So in other words, he admitted the truth of the weakness that was going on. He admitted that he had missed the mark. He admitted that he could no longer guide himself, and it became a life-affirming and powerful gift to him, which is essentially what John wants to say about confession of sin. This is life-affirming and powerful. This is confession is speaking in agreement with. That's, that's how the word is, word is formed in the Greek. Speaking in agreement with. In agreement with who? Well, in the Christian context, it's in agreement with God. That God has, God has shown you something in your heart and you're going to 
speak agreement to that with that in fact you you know god's it's god's activity going on in your heart because we can only assume that you would not even know what was going on there that was missing god's mark for your life you would have the, just the barest notion of what the image of christ could be how it could be expressed in your life and how you're missing out on that but God's grace and God's spirit begins to, begins to convict your heart. So he's, he's there at the beginning of it. He's giving you the strength to speak it. And he is giving you this, his spirit to continue on toward perfection. To continue on to acquire love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is an activity of God's grace that you participate in. And so this is, this is what confession is. And it is life-affirming, it is powerful, it is, it, is the, it is the cane the blind man needed, it is growing in God's word. And so at this point, we must ask why we don't do it that well. We do not confess well. I, you know, some, I, I would love to hear, somebody cuts you off in traffic, and you honk your horn, and you shout, I'm very impatient. That would be great, right? Um, you're up there, and, and somebody's done a, done a bad, you know, doing a bad job or something, and you, they, oh, it's a retail thing, and you're complaining. And you, you lean toward the manager whom you have called to hear your, com hear your complaint, and you say, I want to tell you just one thing. I have lost all sense of proportion. <laughs> you know? Or you're with somebody and, they're, and you're doing a job and he's just fumble-footing around and it's getting, getting on your nerves and you just say, I have anger issues. That would be confession. That would be bringing it out. That would be saying, you know, walking in the light. And you do realize this is a big deal for John. If you look at this passage carefully, we were back there with walking in the light. If we walk in the light as he is in light, we have Fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. Ah, he brings up the cross. He brings up the, the faithfulness and the justness of God to pour his love out in the world in the self-giving attitude of his son Jesus on the cross, because that's where that blood comes from. And then, without drawing a line so that you make sure and see it, but it's right there, if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just, to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's the same work. It's the same thing going on. He, he brings up the cross and the forgiveness of sins twice. I think you could get John here and he said, if you're walking in the light, you're confessing your sins. If you're confessing your sins, you'll be found to be walking in the light. It's a big deal for him. He doesn't think, I don't think you could, could get out of him to say, can you walk in the light and not confess your sins? He said, no way. This is part of what it means to walk with God and to be in his way. You begin with your own heart to speak his truth even when that truth is about you. Now we have difficulty with this. We were hoping to avoid confession because we were looking at this and, and I know that, that this, this line, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and the blood of Jesus Christ and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I have read that during communion services. It's a beautiful line. And you hate to go on to the line that says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. John casts a fairly serious cast on, on you know, tone upon the whole thing. If we say we have not sinned, if we don't find ourselves speaking along in agreement with God, what is happening here? Now, it's rather interesting that uh, people will often say, you could probably get a large group of people to agree that many of the major politicians tell lies. You could also get a large person, number of people to agree with the statement, many people believe politicians' lies. Good, good so far. That's American tradition. That has been going on for 250 years, I can tell you that much. Nobody ever says, that politician lies and I believe all his lies. 
Because it would be absurd to say you believe lies. That's like saying, I'm a liar, I lie all the time, I'm lying right now. You can't make sense of that statement because is it a lie or is it the truth? In other words, John is, is, is coming around here to say, if you say you have not sinned, you make God a liar. What you're expressing in your life, that's, his, that's that word for the expression of one's life when he says make God a liar. That's what you're expressing in your life it's a disconnect and a gap between the reality that is God and the lived reality of your own life. And it's going to dwell, and it's going to fall into absurdity. It's going to come, it's going to bear no fruit or bad fruit. And it's going to lead you down blind alley after blind alley and blind alley. It's going to be anything except walking in the light. You cannot just do this. It's a satanic thing to do because you could, you could find that Satan knows about the faithfulness of God. Satan knows about the, the goodness of God. He knows all about his grand plan of creation. He, he knows the plan of redemption that, that God has brought forth and he just elects to live entirely apart from that. And so John is saying, no, no, you, you have a choice. He's a big one or the other guy. He's a big conversion it's walk out of that old life, embrace this new which is walking in the light, embrace this new which is the fellowship with God, embrace these things because this is where the life of Christ is expressed in you. And he's big on this. And he says, this is either making God a liar, to walk into, walk out of the universe as we know it into the universe of sin, or let his word be in you because his word is not in us, or it can be in us. But who, who goes around saying they have not sinned? We don't do that. We have, we have many. I, I mean, you can, you can get any range of absurd people if you turn on your radio or your TV or, or read in print for a while. And, but you'll not run into anybody who says, I never do anything wrong. You don't see that. We, we immediately, we, even the people with a very feeble uh, you know, lunatic meter would, it would ding at that. You would say, no. But we'll find that the world does do this. I mentioned before here that, that our, our, our nation has a, a pornography problem. It's a huge pornography problem. If you judge by, judge by the level of use, internet, internet traffic, uh, money spent, any, uh, any measure, we, ha we have as a, as a, national community that problem. And it is interesting, the responses you can get about that that more or less paraphrase the statement, I have no sin. Because while on the one hand I can, I can talk to men of my generation or my peer generation, remember I'm actually 29 years old, and appearing to be this age just because facade. Uh, if you talk to my, men of my generation, they, they, they know they know they shouldn't be in that. But you can talk to the young, and they will say, well, first you, you confront them. You say, what's with this stuff on your phone? You, say, you look at your internet history, you, look, you think that's right. What, what this image, why are you doing that? You talk to the young, they'll say, well, that's no big deal. What is that but a paraphrase of, I don't have sin? It comes of ignorance. It comes of, or willful ignorance, not knowing that the Old and New Testaments are full of warnings against sexual immorality, that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, you know not look at a woman lustfully is like committing adultery with her in your heart. It is a violation of human dignity and everything that, that, uh, that God has put forth as far as us bearing the image of God and the redeemed image of Christ in our hearts. And it's just a plain from the world's standpoint, an ignorance of that truth. But it is, in, a sense, in essence, saying, and it's in many other things, we don't have any sin, nothing to see here. This isn't that bad. Well, okay. It does infect people of faith. I was, um, I was fascinated by, by survey studies and, and things that, that were, had taken place not amongst just whoever, but among people like people that I serve. Say the, the, the community of Minerva could be profiled pretty easily and people could, you could ask people about their religious viewpoints. And I was, I was getting excited. 
and, and conceive possibilities, because 60% or more of the people would agree with statements that go, go, go along with the, the Christian faith. They would say things like, is the Bible the word of God? Yes, 60% or more. Uh, is Jesus God's son? Yes, 60% or more. Is there just but one God who has created the world? Yes, they, they would answer that. They would answer an affirmative to that. Do people need to be saved by the, by the blood of Jesus on the cross to, to get to heaven? Yes, they do. Do you need to be born again to have a relationship with God that leads you to heaven? Yes, yes, that's 60% or more of the people. And the problem is, is that, you know, if 60% of the people in the community I was serving were going to church, we wouldn't have seats for them. You can talk about, you can talk, there's a lot of churches in this town, but do realize if all the unchurched decided to come one morning, we don't have seats for them either. So you got to one last survey question, which was, and the things in the Bible tell me that I should be regularly in worship. Well, it dropped from 60 to 30%, just like that. Well, which put it right, about 30% of us are regular in worship. Well, that's interesting. And, and, you know, so in other words, this is the truth, this is the truth, this is God, I, I believe the things about God, I love Jesus, oh, it's awesome, but this one thing that makes, would make me less happy and comfortable, well, no, that, um, no. Now, that's a complete ignorance of what the Word of God says. The Word of God says, do not neglect the gathering together of each other. It calls us to worship. It calls us to praise God. doesn't say do it all alone. It calls us to hold one another in love. John says we have the, a, perfect, a perfect aspect of our fellowship with God is our fellowship with one another. And so we will find that, again, people will say, well, no, I don't see anything wrong with not being regular in worship. Well, because, well, apparently we're at the we don't have sin. Now, but this is about confession. And it wouldn't be any, it would have not, I would not be doing my job if I left you say, well, there are some bad and foolish people out, outside those walls. They need to come in here and confess. Boy, so and so should have been in this sermon here. They well, you needed to hear that. No. It happens in the church because, again, it's missing the mark. I'm not saying you set yourself to do evil-hearted things. I'm saying you'll find that you're doing them. I had a friend, well, we had a friend, we, pastor we knew well. I knew him pretty well, um, serving. And um, he got married uh, to a lady, we'll call her Jacqueline. Now, now, our friend, the pastor, was quiet, was thoughtful, mild in his speech, um, careful in how he expressed things, you know, just, just wanted to, you know, easy to talk to and, and wanted to hear your side and, and just, just generally calm and kind of a peaceful guy. You could say that's a really peaceful pastor full of love, or you could say he's kind of a spineless weasel. I'm, I'm kind of one of those too, you know, kind of, you know, just, I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. This was our friend, and he married Jacqueline. And, oh, Jacqueline was outspoken. Jacqueline would listen to you and then tell you exactly what she thought of what you just said. She was talented with her music and, 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 just, and would, would, would want to share it. She was open with her opinion and, and loud with her speech. He was small and she was pretty large, man. He was, she was everything he was not. I'm telling you, that was real popular in church. Can you imagine that? We observe this, because we're good friends, and observe this. Yet a portion of this church took an instant dislike to her and never gave it up. They would, they would talk about how she, she must be at home. She's probably bossing him around. Uh, how, how, what the last thing she said at church. Talk about the air she put on. Talk about how she couldn't possibly have, you know, the, the, the Christianity right because of just, just her attitude. Uh, they kept up and kept up. You know what they would say if you challenged them on that attitude? Well, they'd say a version of we have no sin. 
I gave her a chance. I thought, do I, you, you know what she said to me when I talked to you? I tried. Not the same thing, because in the same time, it's because the world is not made up of all the same kinds of people, which is why we have Jacqueline's. This is why Jacqueline's marry my guys like my friend. This is fun. Awesome. But look, there were people who knew her. They knew her as a person of faith. They knew her as a person of genuine compassion, a person who was serious about the sharing of her gift of music. A person who was, who was wise in counsel if you sat down and, and talked to her about a problem. A person who dearly and passionately loved her husband. A person who sold out to God. But she just had her little ways. But it was hard to get to know her in that respect if the first group got a hold of you and told her what an evil-minded harpy she was. And so, you could observe from the outside, well, there's this group. Has no use for her. Gave up on her a long time. I've, I tried. You don't, you don't know what she said when I brought in those cupcakes. And, and, and this side that knew her from this other aspect. Well, I ask you, which group is walking in the light? Which group is taken seriously the command from God to be in fellowship with one another? Which one is taken seriously that our fellowship with Christ, as St. John would put it, is tied up, used in the same sentence with our fellowship with one another? In other words, they have missed the mark. That's what we're confessing about that the Lord has a lot of things he wants to express in your life and, and you're getting in the way, you're tugging this way and tugging that way. Yeah. That he has a lot of wisdom he wants to show and you need, needs to show you and you need to grow in his word such that it cuts some of that inside, causes it to bleed, causes it to be uncomfortable. The Lord wants to teach you his love and his patience and needs you to speak in agreement and participation with him about what he knows about you. So that's an invitation. We have a time to, to be alone with God, with our own, our, our heads bowed, our eyes closed, the altars open. It was, it's, it, there's, there's that time that you just need to be knelt, kneeling before him. But John would say this, you know, you're, you're walking in light and you're confessing sins. They go together. So let's bow together. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we ask, Lord, that your, your hand would be with us today, that we would speak in agreement with you of what you know about us, what you have called us to be and to do, what you, where you have called us from out of darkness into your wonderful light. Lord, we wouldn't be those people who can hold on and say, no, nothing to see here, Lord, that, that we know in front of our eyes we have, we have made a made a barrier between you and our heart. Lord, speak to us in our, in our hearts and, and cause us, Lord, to give confession to you. Let there be an open dialogue, an open speech, Lord, that, that you would speak to us and our lives today would be full of you taking your, the seat of your, of, of your love upon our, the throne of our heart. Lord, we, we call out to you. And just ask that you be with this congregation as it prays and as it responds to your love. In Jesus' name, you can sing to